deep. They're very serious. I had to do an examination in talking French in high school. We got a list of subjects and we need to talk. I had a very low grade. I had a four or a five, all during the high school. It was terrible. And when the examination came, they asked me, what do I want to talk about? I, I said that I want to travel to Japan. I got 98 <laughs> out of 100. I don't know how. Okay, I started doing things with lighting. I mean, going back, I can remember lighting in the age of three. So I guess um, it chose me, not the other way around. Now, I was trying to do something for this Japan conference, and so I wrote myself a subject it has a lot to do with light, and that's ab abstract to see. Um, okay. And um, I asked, what, what should I talk about? And they said, well, if you're going to lighting and enlightenment, I mean, la architectural lighting design, you should do the last four years max. So, yeah. So I could see a different approach, like you said before about the glass and so on, getting more and more open in Japan, and um, more and more architectural lighting designers are existing in Japan. Our profession became known in 2007 in London. The beginning of the organizations were in the United States in 73 and in 91 in Europe. From 91, you have Japanese lighting designers. So now, how do you split the role of light between architects, engineers, and lighting designers? All of us are doing, dealing with the same thing from different places. I would say that after listening to you talking, I felt like if we're talking about light today is something that is between storytelling and emotion or feelings. Lighting design is something that you don't touch and you don't see unless it touches something. It doesn't exist if you don't have fog or dust or water or nothing, it's not there. If it doesn't touch anything, it's not there. So the separation I did in the work was separating between daylight, natural light, that most of the time until, let's say, recently, was traditionally done by the architects, not anymore. And um, our, our, you know, this kind of artificial lighting design that we have at dark. So we deal in a dark work world and the architect are dealing in a, in a clear world, in a lightful world, question mark. Is it true in Japan? Can we do analog between Japan and us? Not really. Japan sits in a different place geographically and culturally and the nature is different. And by the way that I was looking at the work, I saw that all those architects of the time that I'm talking about had a contact, a very strong connection to nature and material, that some of them are wood, yes, cement, but the glass and the metal and those things are coming from a lot with wood, a lot of water, a lot of reflecting, and, and in the other side, a lot of diffusing light because there are fogs and because the light is different and you have the vertical trees that you see everything through them. So they are like vertical lines that you see the sun through and shapes and frames. You see things through frames, 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 frames. We don't. Our sun is strong 
the volume is too much, the air is full with dust, the intimacy of our culture need to, uh, to have us inside. Did you ever pay attention to the windows in Jerusalem and why they are so small? Because nobody wants others to look inside their house. That's first, that's society. But in the same time, if the sun is going in and it's coming in most of the day, if it comes directly, it's heating, it's uh, making everything die, it's, I mean, die in color, uh, and uh, it's too strong, too, too glary, and too bright. So it's a different kind of sun. The un united point of it is sun, I mean, natural light means movement. So as we are people that build houses for people, we are building things for us and the way that we see and get it in our mind, then we were prepared in our body to work somehow with the natural sun that is around us. If I teach my students lighting and architectural lighting, uh, basically I say, you can't look at Paris, you can't look at New York, you can't look at London, you can't do copy-paste, doesn't work. Go to Mexico, go to Texas, go to Florida, go to Afghanistan, Uzbekistan, and who knows where, and maybe Australia, because it's in the negative, just the other side. So in architecture in Australia, we find a lot of things in common. So it is really interesting to go and look into the Japanese thing, because it's different. So, okay. I found that like the stories that I learned when I was in school is that the architectural culture have things to do in the local, that is ritual, and they're very close to earth and water and stuff. And then culture always arrived from the outside, then they accept it, then they find themselves in it, they got in power. It's, again, I'm talking like somebody sitting on the fence and looking at the zoo on the Japanese. It's something that is really radical, okay, in that way. But just, you know, excuse me for that. And so that was the thing that I learned. So I did this kind of way of where it's going. The local, then it receiving from the outside, then it goes accepting what it needs to be accepting. The spiritual things get really inside fast. By the way, lighting and spiritual is important in any kind of religion that we're talking about because it is basic, because what is not lit, we can't see doesn't exist, okay? So only when things are being lit, then we can get them. And the way that somebody is deciding how to light them, he's doing the designing, he's creating the world, he's pretending to be God a little bit, and he decides what world the person that are living there will live in. Okay, so, I met all these things, editing, tuning, making it fine, and all that. And I would say the Japanese architecture is all the time dialogue with this, and receiving, changing it, making their own. And then I would say that it goes again, if, you say, if we say modern architecture, so we can see all this going very fast from, uh, let's say, the 20s, and the, the, world, the Second World War, and after the Second World War, we can see the architect of the West, the modern architect, getting into the Japanese, and they change it. And they do that. Okay. Now I tried here. This is the sentence I said before. We can be passive or active. I, I will read it. Only what is lit can be seen. How and what can be controlled in passive or an active way. In natural lighting, we are the passive. In artificial, we can be passive or active. Natural light is always movement. It's changing during the day. Okay, so those are the things that, yeah, maybe. This is an architect. They are doing the work in Milan with light. Ah, cool. 
The text that went in it, like about it, is about the trees in Japan. It's the forest. The forest is very important. Okay, so anal analyzing it, I would say natural is the forest, is the seasons, it's the color between white and dark, the contrast, the diffusion, the, the frost. And we can see each one of those things in, in work of the designers and architects. Local sun. It, it, you judge it by volume, by beam, by dynamic, by shadows, by north light. They have north light and reflection. And the third thing that we do is observation. Diffusion, indirect light, vertical, uh, woods, ito, work with woods, movement, rhythm, and cement. That was ito's work. Okay, now uh, that's... a. a that's a job, that's something that got a award of merit in, um, in our organization. So I guess it had some awards in other organizations. It got an award of merit in 2014. And so... Okay, so we can see the in and out and the diffusing of the light that is coming through those big lampens or canopies or whatever they are. And sitting underneath the shade, especially the library is very, very important to have diffused light because the other light can ruin the books. So it has this kind of uniformity of light. And here we have some we're going back to 2009 to the time that uh, a project was in the outside 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 japan it, i think it was the first time that they did this kind of canopy and um, and so we have those two that you can see it and then it is very important to try to shade the lamp sources the it's almost getting to be un unseen. Okay, now I, I went back to today on though just because I saw in his, in his work, I saw a lot of vegetation. And I saw a project about the frames using the greenery as a frame inside and out. And then on the next project, I, I saw making especially the frames like in the windows here like all this building is holding a frame that is a window like a periscope in a way and you are looking into things through one frame second frame three frame more frame everything is going like a perspective inside and then there is a nature here that is kind of uh, starting to deal with artificial light with the architectures also. 
okay, some more concrete uh, entrances, windows that the light come from above. By the way, if you do it in Israel, it will be really bad because you can cook an egg on the floor. So this kind of things, you don't open glass in the ceiling. If you do skylighting in Israel, it's a problem. It's very trendy, but it's problematic. Okay. Okay, now I started to look on some architects and then take some, some of them and I saw in all of them some things that were together and I could see, like the nature again and this apartment with the glass, all the side is made of glass bricks, so it's not transparent in the way that it's clear, but it's kind of foggy and there is uh, all this here, the pictures that are here are showing all the craft work of creating this wall, really interesting, and s a little pictures of whatever are looking and glamping in this thing. Okay, so I try to put the names at the work. Here we have Kenzo Kuma that he's working a lot with wood, and he's working like, um, he's making a net of wood, I would say getting in and out, in and out, and then there are some holes that the light can go in, but it's, it's a fence. And then he arranged, there are some others that are arranging uh, the light in strings, so you can see it, how it goes, and use of fluorescent tubes in lines, not because of how the light will do in the surface, but uh, if you go to the Mediatek in Japan, Every floor has another arrangement of light. Some are random. Then the floor above is strips. Then the <laughs> it's just playing games with the fluorescent tubes. I want to see, he wants to see what can he do with the fluorescent tubes. How can he shape the ceiling? The ceiling is another piece to look at. Okay, so uh, now I, go, I got some about outside and inside and getting outside of Japan and doing projects outside of Japan. So some, some of the projects are in Denmark and Amsterdam and many other places. And then again, you see the framing work, the darkness. When I read oh, everything and saw, read and heard all those little films and videos, I felt a lot in common, not because, that we, not because the idea that we have the same kind of nature, but because of the emotion. I felt that we are emotional people. Even the Japanese, that they are like traditionally, we say, no, no, no. When you go into it, you see they're very emotional. And uh, in the work, they are working with darkness and light, minimalistic things being very clear, understanding the shadow sometimes is more important than the light. It all works until you get into the commercial places. When you get into commercial places, then it has to be practical. So it is overlit and the color, and the color light of the light is cold. It's like four to six Kelvin. It's really, really cold this way. It has to be, it's glary, it's that it. Everything has to be the same. No drama. In here, you can see in the pictures that there are drama. And more drama. Okay, so I went on and searched even more architects, but it was all the time I felt that I saw the same things. I saw the frames, I saw the opening in a different thing, the wall as a stick wall, and then how to open it in not an easy... Now, let's look about this window here. There's no window here. There is an opening here. The sun that is coming from here, I don't know what direction it is. Through the pictures, I don't know what's northeast and west or south. So I need some pictures from the inside in order to know, to know it well. But the sun in Japan is 45 degrees. Ours is between 63 in winter to 83 in summer, that is almost horizontal. So in, in Japan, and it changed between 
South Japan to North Japan. Okay, so um, here I think I start having some sanas and I have some movies of them. The glass was very important material for us. This site is very beautiful and uh, not only one direction, every direction uh, we can enjoy the view. My first thoughts were who can make over 200 unique pieces of glass and customize to the specifications that Sana was looking for. Light, for example. Each area has a own characteristic light condition. So the glass has a lot of influence from the outside area. The season or the weather, the appearance becomes so different. So we basically sent out a request for proposals to procure, engineer, and install the glass. The glass was manufactured in England. Each individual piece of glass is sealed, the air inside of it, and that's done in Germany. It looks like a solid piece of glass, but they're actually glued together with a piece of film called PVB, and then bent in Spain and glued together in Spain and then shipped to the United States as a sealed unit. And that sealed unit is what prevents any kind of condensation from forming inside or on the outside of the glass. When I approach from back, I can see this side, but also I see together with nature behind me and also can see through the building. It's a mixture. The one, those two here is a building in Budapest. Those are Sanas, both of them. And by the way, I found an architect that used to work in their office and now he has his own that is doing interesting things. And uh, so, and we do have, I think I have small conversations like, but if you're bored with it, I Kazuo do, yeah. Sejima and Rui Nishizawa of the architectural practice Sana, we invited to design the pavilion in 2009. It was the second time that we appointed an architect from Japan. And interestingly, we began the sort of playing with the Japanese architectural dynasty. There was Ito, of course, who's a grandfather. Uh, Sejima and Nishizawa, who were the parents, and latterly, and more recently, Sufujimoto, who was a kind of son. Their pavilion was so restrained and gorgeous. The use of aluminium came back. They had the swooping canopy, which was something that was very important to them. And I think what was so fascinating about the Sana proposal was that it really embraced the parkland setting and this peculiar English weather we have throughout the summer. So when it rained, it was really gorgeous. And when the sun shone, it was really sublime. So there was no perfect moment to see the pavilion. It was fascinating to see it as it merged into the landscape, depending on the weather. And fascinating to see it too, how that reflective material gave back the park to itself and also to us as a way of underscoring how important the context of the pavilion was then and continues to be. It was very, very finely tuned. The poles that supported the canopy, I think there was something like, you know, over 150, and it felt a very light touch on the park.
שיהיה לכם כיף. אוקיי, מיקרופון. צריך כזה קטן כזה. אוקיי, אז that's some more pictures of other architects with their name on, some that are less, let's say, celebs. But the work is, you can see the things that goes together with it. And I will go fast. Here you have Su Fajimoto, that you probably talked about him before. And you can see his, his piece of work that we saw the movie before, and the vertical and horizontal work he's doing. Then there are some uh, art lights that are involved in the inside, in opening windows too, that are diagonal and so on. Now, I start to deal with some lighting designer, and this lighting designer, Akira Lisa Ishii, she's the second generation. It's okay, I'll go fast. She lives in Paris. Her mother is a very known architectural lighting designer, one of the first in Japan. And, and she's doing a lot of work with Artimide, doing uh, industrial lighting uh, firming. And uh, work in, this is from uh, um, the Lyon Festival of Light, the one down. And those two are from uh, a work she did with Artemide. And that's her mother. And her mother did a lot of things and uh, she, oh, she started in the 60s and she did movies. And that's interesting because we can see some of the Japanese architects that started by doing movies too. So the architectural lighting designers are uh, artists that combine a lot of formats and Itsuko Ishii made some movies that are very 60s, black and white, dark and so on. But she did large projects, you can see the scale. And that's the last project she did in 2010. It's a very tall building and uh, that's it. So she's very known and she did conservation and um, master planning and things like that. And then I, I brought to, to the class another big name, that's the name is Kuromande, and Kuromande is a, is a mature man with a very young soul and uh, a lot of humor. And what he did, he arranged in Japan a very uh, new and young organization called NLP. And the organization have offices in Japan, in China, and in Taiwan. And he has something like 80 very young lighting designers working with him. So, uh, and he did many things. He did uh, memorial places. And you could see the way that we are dealing with the darkness. That's the address. And he, he published some books. Some of them are, are even in English. And so I just let it. And I'm, I put some of the work of the young, young lighting design, designers, like ICE and so on, that the, all of them are member of the IALD Japan. The interesting thing that, that they also, all of them doubled and tripled the number of architectural lighting design in Japan in four years. There were like one column, I have it, I can show you later. One call of name of lighting designers in 2011, and now it's a full page with like four columns. So the profession is going very, very fast. And that's it. Um, the, this picture is a project of mine in a gum museum in Rishon Lezion, and you can see that I'm dealing with darkness and light inside art museum with the work of Agam that is very difficult to light because it's not colors, it's a uh, car kind of metal kind of color. But that's it.